Moscow's Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netroomsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte Donald correct. Trump's lawyer, Alina Haba, the worst lawyer in prêt. America, is at it again. She just sent a letter to federal judge Lewis Kaplan, who presided over the E. Jean Carroll defamation trial against Donald Trump, where Trump was hit with an $83.3 million verdict. And in this letter from Haba to Judge Lewis Kaplan, Alina Haba attacks Judge Kaplan, claims that he had an undisclosed conflict of interest with Roberta Kaplan, the lead lawyer for the plaintiff, E. Jean Carroll. And Alina Haba says that it was inappropriate that Judge Kaplan did not disclose this relationship. And it's threatening... The letter looks extortive in nature. I'll go read it to you. And Alina Hoppe says, surely you will provide some additional information to us as we uh, start preparing our appeal. And now the evidence of this so-called conflict of interest is a New York Post article. And the New York Post article, which is a Murdoch property, says Trump lawyers to use conflict of interest between Judge Carroll's attorney in appeal of $83.3 million jury verdict. Insane. So it is basically like a corrupt loop, a feedback loop, if you will, here of a Murdoch property going to Alina Haba. Do you believe that there's a conflict? Alina Haba saying, oh, well, that's insane. And then claiming that that is evidence. Folks, I hope Judge Lewis Kaplan just sanctions Alina Haba at this point. This is such a frivolous filing. Uh, Roberta Kaplan, through a spokesperson, told the New York Post there is no conflict of interest. Roberta Kaplan was a young associate at the time working for a law firm called Paul Weiss, which has over a thousand lawyers. And Judge Lewis Kaplan was a senior partner that she never worked for Judge Lewis Kaplan while she was at the firm. And that this is all entirely without merit. This is simply more of the kind of fodder for Donald Trump and MAGA to go and attack the judiciary, attack the judicial system, claim there's some conspiracy because they are completely and entirely in the wrong. Alina Haba is a horrific lawyer, and the evidence showed that Donald Trump, back in the May trial, sexually assaulted E. Jean Carroll, and a jury ruled that Donald Trump's responsible for $83.3 million in damages for defaming his rape victim. Here, just take a look right here at uh, the letter that Alina Haba sent. This is pathetic, folks. Dear Judge Kaplan, this letter is submitted on behalf of, and she refers to Donald Trump as president, even though he's not, because that's the weird MAGA cosplay that Donald Trump's the president. As a result of a story published in New York Post, 
defense counsel learned for the first time of allegations that your honor, while a partner at the Paul Weiss firm, had a quote, mentor type relationship with plaintiff's lead counsel, Roberta Kaplan. And they go and they cite a New York Post article attached as Exhibit A. And that article is this article that Trump's lawyer to use conflict of interest between Judge and Carroll's attorney uh, in appeal. It's not exactly an investigative piece. It's a corrupt feedback loop. It goes on to say in this uh, in this letter, most concerning is that the article was brought to the New York Post's attention by an unnamed partner at Paul Weiss who was aware of the close relationship between you and Miss Kaplan and stated that, quote, Lou was like her mentor. The underlying defamation case tried last year and the damages trial completed last week were both litigations in which there were many clashes between your honor and defense counsel. We believe and will argue on appeal that the court, referring to Judge Kaplan, was overtly hostile towards defense counsel and Donald Trump and displayed preferential treatment towards plaintiff's counsel. Indeed, the rulings, tone, and demeanor of the bench raised significant concerns even before the New York Post investigative journalism unearthed new facts. Not exactly investigative journalism where the article talks about a motion that you intend to file and says an unnamed source said Lou was like her mentor which is not even true and accurate. And it just goes on to show you the whiny victimhood of Trump and MAGA. We're going to argue to the Court of Appeals that you treated us unfairly and that the tone that you had and the way you spoke to us was mean. I don't know, Alina Haba, maybe it's the fact that you missed all of the relevant deadlines, failed to assert affirmative defenses, that you told the jury in your opening statement and closing statement, closing argument, that Donald Trump gave his rape victim what she always wanted. He gave her the fame that she wanted. She should be grateful for him. Maybe it was your horrific lawyering. Maybe it was that and, and the horrific underlying conduct that was at issue. Not that the judge was just randomly mean to me. I mean, again, the victimhood and the whiny nature as a lawyer is one of the things that I'm just like, if I had a law student in my class or in an undergrad student in one of my classes whine like this, I'd be, I'd be like F. But I guess Alina Haba got the equivalent of an F at trial. If your honor truly worked with Miss Kaplan in any capacity, especially if there was a mentor-mentee relationship, that fact should have been disclosed before any case involving these parties was permitted to proceed forward. This issue is particularly concerning since plaintiff's other lead counsel, Sean Crowley, served as your honor's law clerk and we were previously advised that your honor co-officiated her wedding. 28 U.S.C. 455A states that any judge of the United States shall disqualify himself in any proceeding in which his impartiality might be reasonably questioned. While not every mere friendship between a judge and a lawyer warrants disclosure and possible recusal by a judge, as the Fifth Circuit recently explained, recusal and disqualification issues based on possible bias or prejudice require a, quote, highly fact-intensive inquiry. Well, first off, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals does not supervise New York federal courts. That would be the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And then you hadn't filed a motion for a recusal if you believe that the Sean Crowley serving as a law clerk for the judge, which is a public record, you could have filed a motion to disqualify. If you believe that there was some issue between uh, Roberta Kaplan and Judge Kaplan, which is non-existent, that's why it was never disclosed in the first place, because it is not a true and accurate thing. Well, if you would have said, oh, I'm suspicious, you could have filed a motion to disqualify, which you did not. Here, this is what Alina Haba, here's how she closes the letter. Here, without knowing more information or having specific factual denial by your honor that you had a mentor-mentee relationship with Ms. Kaplan, we are unable to flesh out our position concerning what specific relief should be requested, including but not limited to moving for new trials on the issue of liability and damages. Surely, however, this court should provide defense counsel with all of the relevant facts. At minimum, this information could certainly prove relevant 
to Donald Trump's forthcoming Rule 59 motion. We thank you for its prompt attention. We thank the court for its prompt attention to this troubling matter. I hope, I hope that Judge Lewis Kaplan just drops the hammer on Alina Haba. Her language, her demeanor, by the way, Rule 59 is a motion for a new trial or to alter or amend the judgment. But the level of disrespect from such an incompetent stooge, drop the hammer on her, Judge Lewis Kaplan. Refer her to the state bar. She's been pathetic and she's been a disgrace to this to the legal profession. What a horrific and horrible disgrace of a lawyer Alina Habba is. A real stain on the legal profession. Pathetic, pathetic. Let me show you this. Alina Habba said this at an interview. She'd rather be pretty than smart because she thinks that she can fake being smart. Play this clip. I'll tell you something. Somebody said to me, Alina, would you rather be, um, would you rather be smart or pretty? And I said, oh, easy, pretty. I can fake being smart. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that worked out that well, Alina Haba. Oh, and by the way, here's the clip of Alina Haba from a month or so ago where she spoke at the right wing turning points event where she bragged how in the Southern District of Florida, she was sanctioned by that federal judge about a million dollars. And she goes, it was fake news why this wasn't reported. Newsflash, it was reported and you got sanctioned because you filed a patently frivolous lawsuit and she goes and brags about it to MAGA. That got assigned to a Clinton appointed judge. What do you think happened? Nobody's heard of the case, right? It's because it's gone. I never met the judge. I never walked into the courtroom. There were probably 50 lawyers representing all of the radical left. Clinton's lawyers, Mook's lawyers, and the list goes on and on and on. One month, it got dismissed and me and President Trump got sanctioned a million dollars for going against crooked Hillary. What? You didn't know that, did you? Fake news, folks. Fake news. They won't report it. But guess what? We paid that million and we're going to keep on fighting. The biggest bunch of grifter losers and just the whininess of them. Whining, whining. We're so much better than this, America. It is Tuesday, the 30th of January of 2024, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, the little Yorkie, is our door girl, and she's a little under the weather still, but getting better. She's out and about as we speak right now, but uh, we will be seating you directly for our especially special, daily special, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A small scant dash, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. It always has, and it always will. Yes, our little Yorkshire Terrier is... uh, She's getting better. I don't know if she got into something or what, but she had been quite listless to the point where I was getting a little worried. Um, and I got to tell you, unfortunately, it wasn't really the time to take her into the vet. The only vet around here that she would have been able to possibly see is about 50 miles away. And you could wait there for a couple of days. So I thought, I don't know, maybe I'll just wait until a weekday when I can take her into my vet. So, but she's gotten a bit better and uh, eating and taking water. Uh, She doesn't quite want to climb the steps that we have up to the couch and other pieces of furniture, but she will get down from them. So, uh, but right at this moment, she's out and about outside. So, uh, 
going to let her be. Check in on her uh, at a break. So <laughs> hopefully the break won't be too long. <laughs> anyway, I hope your day is going well. Um, yeah, I uh, just little tidbits of news that came to the fore outside of a curated part of the show, mind you. Uh, this uh, clip of Nancy being confronted outside her home uh, about the uh, genocide happening in Gaza. Now, this event in that part of the world began on October 7th when Hamas broke a ceasefire and attacked, well, they're known as the peaceniks. <laughs> the ones trying to broker peace across this divide that has uh, sprung up between Palestinian, Arab, and Israeli, you know, types. Types. And Hamas broke that ceasefire and slaughtered people at a music fe festival. Kids. And by August, what, 20th or so, these uh, this group of women showed up at her house. Now, this is after her husband had his brains bashed in by a MAGA lunatic. And these women confronted her talking about, you're a genocidal maniac. And she rightfully told them, go back to your Chinese headquarters. And why did she say that? Because of the New York Times expose that showed that Code Pink is financed by the CCP. Code Pink's founder. Now, we, we, we reported on this quite a while ago with the expose. Uh, not right when it came out, but uh, after this obvious AstroTurf bullshit occurred the day after October 7th. I just watched a, uh, uh, it might have been on Joy. Yeah, she got caught on a hot mic. Jesus. But I had it on. I, it was around Joy. I think I, you know, I, I got to tell you, lately, I don't watch Joy anymore. She gets on my nerves. But regardless, whoever this uh, talking head was on one of the shows on MSNBC, because that's what I usually watch until I can't anymore, started talking about, well, we told people on October 9th that we knew exactly what the Israelis are doing and they showed exactly what they would do in their response. <laughs> I don't know, know even if the fellow used the term response. Because everything that happened on October 7th was erased. And everything that, that I got to say, a lot of it had to do with BB. Let's be clear about that. But within days, not weeks, not months, days, it was called a genocide. Everything was printed up. People's like... Started complaining about it. Code Pink shows up at Nancy's house after her husband had his brains bashed in by a MAGA lunatic. And the New York Times exposed the backers behind Code Pink. The founder married to an operative of the Chinese government intel apparatus. Now, I know he could probably say, I'm a free agent. Anything to fuck up America. Because he's Canadian, I believe. Level of deniability, apparently. So, um, uh, yeah, that kind of pissed me off because now we have people saying, Nancy is a racist. So she lives in an area that has the highest Asian population. Yeah, right. She didn't say go back to China because they were Chinese or Asian. She told them to go back to Chinese headquarters or their headquarters in China. Because the founder of Code Pink is married to a guy who is a operative of the CCP. 
and I think there was a black lady, and all the rest were white. Not racist. But I love how that's gotten out there. And all these young kids who have been duped. And then when I say young, I mean people, you know, 45 and younger. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm at that point now where I can be cantankerous and call a 45-year-old a kid. <sighs> but certainly younger than that. Who have somehow been duped. By not just Vlad, by not just China. You know, the Iranians are in there, and I would say the North Koreans, too. You know, they're all in there doing their little weedle deedle deedle We actually have a little bit about that, I believe, later on. Or we did have a... Uh, we're going to have some news about uh, some... some uh, data breach again that was uh, not not too nice that it happened we'll get into that some at some point but regardless well that's stated how about we just go into what we have curated for you in today's show and we will so at the top oh yeah Lena Haba oh my god I should mention also since you know I can't watch I can't watch Joy anymore I'm I, I'm kind of boycotting some MSNBC. I just got to do it. Can't can't get away from whatever it is that they're all trying to do again. Platform the victimhood of MAGA and Donald Trump, and then amplify lies even. But regardless, Alina Abba, I love how she thinks that she can school this seasoned judge. My God. The arrogance of these people. They know nothing, and so therefore they think they can do anything. I have had it said to me by a MAGA, who happens to be my brother, who had no political awareness at any point in his life until, by his own admission, that Donald Trump opened his eyes. Yeah, I bet he did. So, um, uh, and what is that? That, uh, you know, we're... Apparently what they say is since they don't know the rules, they can break them all. We can break them all. We don't know the rules. We, we make up our own rules. And yes, that's exactly what they do. But that's not any way to run a representative democracy. That's why they want to get rid of it. Yeah, she's going to, you know, she's going to get in trouble for sending in trouble for sending that threatening letter. Boy, is she on the rest of the menu. A conservative lawmaker suggested in Oregon, an Oregon lawmaker, that Muslims, atheists and other non-Christians are unfit to serve an elected office. He said that tried to deny it, but. It's all on the record. The Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator of Public Schools in South Portland, Maine, has left the state after receiving credible threats from white supremacists. I wonder where they got it. They've always had it. And a Colorado woman whose name is listed on the Minnesota presidential primary ballot as a third-party candidate says she did not agree to run. <laughs> what? Somebody's trying to gum up the works, aren't they? Yes, they are. After the break, we move to the chef's table where... Federal police are investigating the son of former Brazilian President Bolsonaro for spying on his father's opponents. And that would be Brazilian federal police, by the way. Oh, and members of a prominent self-exiled Russian rock group that publicly opposed the invasion of Ukraine face deportation back to Moscow after being arrested in Thailand at Vlad's behest. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
usual at this usual juncture and just tuck into this first offering here of the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And it is by Dirk Vanderhart from Oregon Public Broadcasting. A conservative Oregon lawmaker suggested earlier this month that Muslims, atheists, and other non-Christians are unfit to serve an elected office. State Rep. E. Warner Reschke, Republican of Malin, made the remarks on January 17th in an appearance on Save the Nation. Streamed on Facebook, the daily talk show is affiliated with the National Association of Christian Lawmakers, of which Reschke is a member. It bills itself as taking on major public policy issues facing the United States today from a Christian worldview. When have we never had one? Yikes. The show's host, former Arkansas lawmaker Jason Rapert, or is that Rappert? I like Rapert, spent much of the 28-minute episode asking Reschke about what he called the sad reality of the lax treatment of drugs in Oregon. Reschke, who has repeatedly pressed for a repeal of 2020's ballot measure 110, responded that Drug decriminalization has driven homelessness and crime and makes our state unlivable. Well, why do they want to live here then? <laughs> the Klamath County legislator criticized Democrats for permissive policies. Now, I went to Catholic school in Klamath. And boy, is that a hotbed of Idaho Nazis now. My God, no wonder he's talking like one. And I'm not kidding. And he's argued that spirituality and church leaders are a necessary part of the solution. I bet you do. Roughly 22 minutes into the episode, episode, Rapert, or is it Rappert? Once again, I like Rapert. Asked a broader question. Why Reski feels it is important that Christians be involved in government? government because of the Seven Mountain Strategy. Okay, take over the arts, take over the schools, take over government. Next thing you know, anybody's not a Christian off with their head, just like the good old days. Rescue responded that he was inspired to run for office in 2016 by figures like George Washington, James Madison, Abraham Lincoln and Ronald Reagan. Yeah. <sighs> Well, you know, the first three there, Washington, Madison, and Lincoln, they weren't really, you know, like Christians as this fellow thinks. Now, Reagan might come close only because <laughs> he had no idea what he was talking about, which is usually the course for people who call themselves die-hard Christians. He said that you go back in history and you look at men and the struggles that they faced and the faith they had. Those are the types of people you want in government making tough decisions at tough times. You don't want a materialist. You don't want an atheist. You don't want a Muslim. You want somebody who understands what truth is and understands the nature of man, the nature of government, and the nature of God. Well, those remarks quickly drew fire from the Freedom From Religion Foundation. The group sent uh, Reschke a letter last week that suggested Washington, Lincoln, and Madison were not the devout Christians that he had portrayed and chastised him for his comments. Your duty is to support the state and federal constitutions and to protect the rights of conscience of your constituents, not to promote your personal religious views, much less a Christian theocracy, read the letter, which called on Reschke to apologize to all non-Christian and non-religious people in his legislative district or resign. That's not going to happen because you know how these people are. And Reschke's uh, comment was also flagged by Right Wing Watch. And, of course, that's an initiative of the progressive advocacy group People for the American Way. Yeah, I like those guys. Now, Reschke told Oregon Public Broadcasting in his comments that he his comments had been grossly taken out of context, but... When asked for specifics about what he meant to say, if not that Muslims and other non-Christians are unfit to lead, Reschke did not respond. 
And when they went back to the tape, that's exactly what he said. David Sharp of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here. In the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Shouter Tuesdays. The Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator of Public Schools in South Portland, Maine, has resigned and left the state, saying he fears for his family's safety after receiving threatening letters from white supremacists. The attack on Mohammed al-Badali, who came to the U.S. a decade ago from Iraq after it became too dangerous, comes at a time when many Republicans are opposed to DEI initiatives that include recruiting and retaining faculty and students of color because they're effing racists and bigots. In this reporter's opinion, I don't know, it looks like a fact to me. Al-Badali said he knows from in a from experience in Iraq, how threats can escalate. You hear something first, and the next thing, an action follows. He decided not to find out what that action might be. The December 29 letter released to the AP under a Freedom of Information request contains racist epithets and indicates that the New England White Network told Abadali that he should go back to the Middle East where you belong. Superintendent Timothy Matheny described the letter as the most vile email message I have seen in my 35 years in education. Well, you can uh, thank MAGA and Trump for that. Al-Badali, who announced his resignation a week ago, was an exemplary, exemplary staff member who was making a positive impact on city schools, Matheny said. Because we deeply value the diversity of our students and staff members, this situation has saddened all of us who seek to ensure safe and welcoming schools. Nevertheless, we will continue to pursue diversity, equity, and inclusion here because the importance of that work is even more evident and more urgent to us now. Final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A woman whose name is listed on the Minnesota presidential primary ballot as a third-party candidate says she did not agree to run. Crystal Gable said that she learned her name is on the March 5th ballot for Minnesota's legal marijuana now party from a Google alert. Party leaders uh, told the Minneapolis Star Tribune in an email that they had been talking and posting about this in our leadership group on Facebook, which Crystal is a part of. And Crystal is a party leader, and all indications were that she was ready to be in the Minnesota primary. They said her name has been withdrawn, through, though the Minnesota Secretary of State's office said it remains on the ballot because early voting has already begun. Gable is encouraging people not to vote for her. 
I did not give consent to be on the Minnesota ballot for this race, Gable, who lives in Colorado, said in an email to the newspaper. I was neither approached to run for office by anyone in the Minnesota party, nor was this candidacy validated by the state of Minnesota. People have a common law right not to be forced to be candidates, Gable said. These actions are absolutely anti-democratic, indeed. Well, that brings us to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. You're listening to a celebration in the Levanoffi village in the remote highlands of the island nation of Papua New Guinea. I was here with our Scientific American video crew last year to make a documentary. I and my co-producer Kelso Harper didn't know what any of these words meant. But as the entire village, men, women, kids, grannies, swung their hips, waved branches, and sang in this beautiful heartfelt chorus, We knew intuitively that we were being welcomed. After all of the singing, we were invited to partake in a moo-moo. It's this delicious feast that's made from wrapping meats and vegetables and spices in banana leaves and then cooking them in this massive earth oven with steam and hot stones. Finding myself here, in an island nation that's home to more than 300 tribes and about 850 different languages, was one of the most remarkable experiences of my entire life. Papua New Guinea also happens to be the most linguistically diverse place on Earth. But that incredible diversity is declining. Half of the roughly 7,000 languages spoken today could be gone by the end of the century. And Papua New Guinea, which hosts more than 10% of the world's languages, is now finding its own linguistic diversity under threat. After this experience, I had to learn more. Where have we lost languages in other parts of the world, and how have they been forgotten? Are we trying to bring them back? More importantly, how do we trace the roots of our collective memory back to the very sounds that first made us human? For Scientific American Science Quickly, this is Tulika Bose. Everybody said, why have you come? We have forgotten our language. We do not know what you're talking about. We cannot help you at all. That's Anvita Abi. She's this incredible Indian linguist who specializes in indigenous languages and has this unbelievable passion for decoding grammatical structure. Lately, I had for the last two decades, I had been working on the languages of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. These are the 550 islands in the Bay of Bengal, south of uh, India. She's talking to me about the year 2001, when she first arrived in Port Blair, the capital of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, a territory of India in the Bay of Bengal. Anvita also wrote an article that appeared in our June 2023 issue that goes into this more in depth. I highly, highly recommend reading it and subscribing. Anvita had previously researched more than 80 Indian languages from five different families, but she was there to conduct a preliminary survey of indigenous languages. At first, some of the indigenous residents, known as the Great Andamanese, balked at her request. So I knew that they have some memory of their language, of course, but they were denying it. But Anvita was really persistent. And then she met someone who would change the scope of her research. She called him now Junior. I tried to ask him several words. He said, listen, madam, I have not spoken my language for quite some years, but I know my language. So I'll have to remember. And that gave me a big clue that I have, I can see some ray of hope. When I first heard Anvita's story, I was stunned. I'm half Bengali myself, but I had never heard of the Great Andamanese, the original indigenous peoples who lived in the Great Andaman Archipelago, or about how the British, who established a penal colony in Port Blair in 1858, 
wiped almost all of them out through a combination of gunfire and disease. In the 1960s, by which time the islands were governed by India, only 19 members of the great Andamanese people were left. India settled them on this tiny island called Street Island. And then Anvita visited. There were only nine speakers in 2001 when I reached the island. She knew she had to try to preserve this language family before it all faded away. And so she set out on foot to follow it. It was a very, very tough, I still remember those crocodile-laden creeks that we had to cross. And a lot of snakes who were visiting us day and night, especially at night and the evening. While on this trip, Anvita realized something crucial. And when I presented my results, I claimed that it appears that Great Andamanese is a separate language family and Onge and Jarawa constitute another language family. Before me, some linguists had traveled to Andaman Islands and they had always considered Andamanese as one language family, which had three branches, Great Andamanese, Onge and Jarawa, which I denied that there are no such branches. There are two independent language families. I'm going to pause here. For those of you who aren't familiar with historical linguistics, it's a little like archaeology. But instead of excavating through dirt, a linguist separates layers of a language to uncover the different stages of evolution. And that's what Anvita decided she was going to do. Subsequently, I reached the Andaman Islands with fully equipped with my gear for deciding, deciphering the, you know, the unknown language in 2005. She stayed with people she had met, including now Junior, and collected more than 150 great Andamanese names for different fish species and 109 for birds. But Anvita still couldn't understand the grammar and the linguistic structure of this language family. It was unlike anything she had ever encountered before. So British officials, while figuring out that the Andamanese languages were a little bit like chain links in that neighboring tribes could understand each other, had also failed to understand it. This fancy comparative lexicon published by a British military administrator in 1887 didn't help either. Then Abi had what she thought was this innocuous conversation with Now Junior. I asked him to tell me the word for blood. He looked at me as if I were an utter fool, and he did not reply. When I insisted, he said, tell me where it is coming from. I replied from nowhere because I just wanted the word uh, meaning just one word, blood. He got irritated and he repeated his sentence. He says, where did it come from? Tell me. So I just made up and I said, oh, on the finger. The moment I said that, he immediately said, oh, that will be called Ongte. And then he rattled off, rattled off several words for blood on different parts of body. If the blood emerged from the feet or legs, it was Ote. If it's internal bleeding, it was Ete. It was a clot on the skin, it was Erte. Something as basic as a noun changed forms because of its location. Basically, Anvita realized that the entire grammatical structure of this ancient language family changed depending on the zones of the body. And later on, I realized that it was changing its form several times because every word, every free word as we know, or open class word as we know in grammar, was prefixed by some of the body division markers. To explain, in English we might say, she heads the company, or we face the window. But Great Andamanese uses body parts even more and to describe everything. And Vita divided the lexicon into two classes, free and bound. Words that were free occurred alone, such as the word raw for pick. But words that were bound, nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs, all existed with relation to other objects, specifically parts of the body. And body division markers were seven of them. You might wonder why this is so significant. Because no other known language family has this grammar based on the human body, Great Andamanese actually constitutes its own family. And according to genetic evidence, the Great Andamanese lived in isolation for tens of thousands of years. And Visa realized that the grammar she decoded meant that this original language family came from a time when people conceptualized the entire world through the body. The most beautiful aspect of the language, that it is 
the whole grammar is anthropocentrism it is de- it is depends upon how people perceive the world through their body every activity every modification and every object is seen through the body that gives us insight into early humans and a world view where everything that happens is connected to everything else i'm going to take you back to papua new guinea to this famous famous cultural show in the garoka highlands we asked some people at the festival if they could speak to us in their language what about nice to meet you Like the great Andamanese, some tribes in Papua New Guinea have lived in isolation for years, but its linguistic diversity is still under threat. In fact, most of the thousands of languages that may go extinct in the next century are indigenous. Now Junior left this world in February of 2009. In his untimely death, He took with him a treasure trove of knowledge that can never be resurrected. I'll leave you with these words from Anvita's article. When the older generation can no longer teach the tongue to the younger ones, a language is doomed. And with every language lost, we lose a wealth of knowledge about human existence, perception, nature, and survival. For Science Quickly, I'm Tulika Bose. Science Quickly is produced by myself, Tulika Bose, and Jeffrey Delvisio. This episode was edited by me, Tulika Bose, with music by Dominic Smith. Subscribe to Scientific American to read the full article by Anvita Abi and more in-depth science news. See you next time. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor netrootsradio.com together we are resistance radio i'm rick smith and this is labor history in two On this day in labor history, the year was 1992. That was the day the gravediggers of Chicago ended their 43-day strike. The United Press International's headline declared, The dead will rest in peace now that Chicago-area gravediggers have reached a tentative contract. The gravediggers were part of Service Employees International Union Local 106. The strike started on December 20th when workers at four Chicago area cemeteries walked off the job. At issue was wages, overtime, and health benefits. 22 other local cemeteries then locked out their workers. With the gravediggers on strike and locked out, more than 1,000 burials were delayed. The Chicago Rabbinical Society was able to get a court order for some of the burials to go forward due to Orthodox Jewish practice that requires burial within 24 hours. By the time the strike was settled, 300 burials were still waiting. Unless there is a labor dispute, grave digging is work that does not often find itself in the headlines. It is one of the many unsung types of labor that it takes to keep a big city like Chicago operating. In 1974, the famous radio host Studs Terkel published a book based on oral histories he had conducted with working people over the course of three years. The title of the book was Simply Working. The book featured interviews that ranged from jazz musicians to pharmacists, farmers to welders. One of the most poignant interviews was with a grave digger named Almer Ruiz. Ruiz said, I usually wear myself some black sunglasses. I never go to a funeral without sunglasses. It's a good idea because your eyes is the first thing that shows when you have a big emotion. Always these black sunglasses.
Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River. In the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 50 degrees Fahrenheit, under foggy conditions at the moment and will be cloudy the rest of the day later, with highs near 70. Winds will be out of the southeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour. We are under an active high wind warning that will begin later today and, and last until late tomorrow. We do have considerable cloudiness forecast for overnight with a Occasional rain showers, lows in the low 50s, winds out of the southeast at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Looks like we're going to get about a quarter inch of rain t- tonight, and then another quarter inch tomorrow, with rain showers becoming in the morning becoming a light rain throughout the rest of the day, steady light rain. Highs in the upper 50s saw a considerable drop-off in temperatures. Winds out of the southeast at 10 to 15 miles per hour. It looks like we will be continuing that uh, high wind warning here in the area. So gusts are going to be quite brisk. If you're in a high-profile vehicle, do take care. Pollen is rated as none here in our little town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 22 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is low at level 2. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.95 inches. Visibility is down to a quarter mile. And relative humidity is at 99%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. And that is the weather underground. London is 48 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 51 degrees and mostly cloudy. Rome is 55 and sunny. Bagram is 38 degrees and clear. Kiev is 33 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 66 with a light rain. Tokyo is 43 degrees and clear with a dry air warning. (laughs) Dry air. Looks like Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 64 degrees and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 56 degrees, partly cloudy with its own high wind warning. Chicago, Illinois is 39 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 38 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Brazil's federal police yesterday Monday searched the home and office of Carlos Bolsonaro, the son of former President Jair Bolsonaro and a Rio de Janeiro city councilman two days after the Supreme Court granted the warrants. Police said in a statement that they conducted nine searches yesterday, Monday, as part of a broader investigation into the nation's intelligence agency and alleged spying on political opponents during Bolsonaro's term, which ended on December of 2022. In a decision made public, Supreme Court Justice Alexandra de Mores said the police claim it has identified a group of which Carlos Bolsonaro forms part. 
and they had monitored political enemies and sought information about the existence of investigations related to the children of the then-president. Images broadcast on TV network Global News showed Carlos and his father outside the latter's residence in Angra dos Reis, south of Rio de Janeiro. Police searched the former president's house of any electronic devices, including phones and laptops belonging to Carlos. The two men, along with two of Carlos's brothers, lawmaker Eduardo and Senator Flavio, had been on a fishing trip since five in the morning when they heard of the warrants. Eduardo Bolsonaro, a federal lawmaker, complained that police also seized equipment belonging to an advisor of the former president, who happened to be in the house during the per- police raid, even though he was not targeted by a warrant. In an interview with one of the country's main independent newspapers, O Globo, Flavio accused the police of being on a fishing expedition while he was actually on one. Carlos Bolsonaro's lawyer did not immediately respond to a request for comment from the AP and had not publicly commented on the raid. They never do. The operation comes days after federal police searched the office and home of the former chief of Brazil's intelligence agency under Bolsonaro and a dozen other people. Police statements and Supreme Court documents show police are investigating an organized crime group that operated within the intelligence agency. The group allegedly used the agency's tools and services for political use and political gain. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Restez toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Mary Ilyashina of the Washington Post brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Members of a prominent self-exiled Russian rock group that publicly opposed the invasion of Ukraine may face deportation from Thailand back to Moscow. Supporters fear the musicians in the band, by two, may face persecution if they return to Russia and that their case could be a warning to artists who criticize Putin but manage to thrive abroad despite Kremlin efforts to cut them off from their audiences. Seven members of Bai Tu were detained in Thailand last week after a show on Phuket Island, with authorities citing problems with permits. In the statement, the band said it has always held concerts in accordance with local laws and practices, adding that the show's local organizer incorrectly filled out the paperwork, a minor offense for which they were each fined about $84 and paid on the spot. But after the hearing, the band members were detained by the Thai Immigration Police and taken to Bangkok, where the authorities are expected to rule on their deportation. We have not been presented with any additional charges, the band representative said in a message. The situation and the noise around it suggests that outside pressure played a significant role in our detention. We know that the reasons for this pressure are our creativity, our views, our position. Opposition politician Dmitry Gudkov, who has been in touch with the band, said that Russian authorities have been putting pressure on their Thai counterparts to deport the musicians to Russia. In the statement, Bai Tu said they were not provided a translator during the hearing and could not understand the case documents. 
Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up here tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow. Right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver